Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you this morning. Somebody else say amen. amen. All right. Make sure you're awake and ready to go. Prepare for takeoff. <laughs> Fasten your seatbelts. This is not your mama's Baptist church. I do love this church, by the way. And I'm excited about Believer's Fellowship and what God has called us to. I have, as of September 27th of this year, several months down the road from now, I will be celebrating 45 years of doing ministry. And uh, I know I look so young, it's just hard to believe that. I was three when I started preaching. No. <laughs> but uh, I never would have thought in all my years that God let me be a part of a what we're doing here and what we're doing in other places, the ministries let me be a part of through evangelism, through pastoring hundreds if not thousands of churches and God's let me be a part of and preaching in those churches and crusades and revivals and schools and prisons and I was not put in prison, I was preaching in prison, all right, for those who aren't quite sure what I'm, what I'm talking about there. But being a part of seeing so many people come to Christ and grow in Christ, God's let me to serve on the boards of some of the most exciting ministries I think in the world. Uh, let me preach on at least three or four continents, I think, around 12 different nations I've been able to preach the gospel in. And uh, just glory to God. It's amazing, you know, that, that God will use somebody, anybody, you know. And if you're looking for a testimony, of, you know, if God just won't use anybody, hey, anybody. <laughs> All right? He'll use anybody. And, he, and I, I say that, hopefully encourage you that God's not through with you. He's just getting started. Now, you may think you're through with God. Perhaps that's you here today. Or you're not even sure about getting with God. But you better praise God that he is a faithful and compassionate God. And he has committed himself to us. And he loves us more than we can even imagine. I believe great times are ahead of us. I know that up to this point in my life, the best times I've had in ministry are with you guys. And being here and serving the Lord with, with Believers Fellowship Church. It, it just, it's profound. And the more I think about it, and Kathy and I were doing a little recollecting this week of all the things that God has done and the blessings that, uh, that we've been able to be a part of and to share with you in your lives and ministry. See, many of you come to Christ, to see many of you grow in Christ, to see your children saved and to be baptized in this church and to grow in Christ and to be used by God in their lives. Uh, you know, again, the point of the matter is this, God does want to use us all. And by virtue of the fact that you're sitting here right now, obviously God wants you to hear that. God wants you to know that he has something in mind for your life that usually is far beyond what we think of. You know, if you're here today just as a visitor, this is not my normal sermon that I would preach on any given Sunday morning, but if you come back, you'll see that none of them are all right. So uh, we preach the Word of God. But I do have something just on my heart this week, wrapping up what we've kind of been preaching about over the last several weeks. We started with our first service on Sunday morning of the year, or that Genesis chapter 8, where it says, on the first day of the 10th month, I saw the mountain peaks. Where, that's the story of Noah in the ark, and he's... The mountain peaks are just, the, the ark has come to rest on top of one mountain already, and now the water's receding. The first day of the 10th month equates to our, our American Western ca calendar as January 1st, by the way. So Noah was setting the, uh, in, in the ark on January 1st of the year that he was there. And so it's our January 1st, so I thought it'd be a good time to talk about new beginnings and the expectations and the promises of God. Last week I shared with you eight significant points about, about the first century church and how God has called us to serve the Lord. I also talked a little bit last week about the decline of the church in the world, and especially the decline of the church in the American culture, and how if we stay on course as an American church by the year 2025, Seven years down the road, only about 15% of people will actually still frequently attend church. God's got a, a work in the church he wants to do. God's got a work in our lives he wants to do. God's got a work in your heart and life that he desires to do. We've had the opportunity to be a part of that. You know, we, we use the logo line for our church for such a time as this. And I think it's important that we do realize the times we're in. The Bible says in the Old Testament that the men of Issachar, one of the tribes of the nation of Israel, the men of Issachar were men of understanding and they understood the times. We need to understand these times. And as the church in America would decline during these times, I believe it's time for the church is going to preach the word of God not to decline but to attack and to move forward and to be aggressive in their lives and to be aggressive with their people, to be aggressive in their ministries. We're out 
you know, cognizantly committed to serving Christ with all our heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. And that, that's all of us together. There, there's no individuality here in regard to that. That's what God wants the church as, as a corporate to do. Yeah, God individually works in our life. He individually has plan for our life. He has purpose for our life. But we discover great joy and great blessing, great purpose when we're all doing what God has called us to do. We've talked many times in the past about why do we even exist as a church, and I think you can pretty much summarize why we exist in the church in, in, in two passages of scriptures. In fact, there's probably two most important passages in the, in, the, in the scriptures for the church is concerned, and really these two passages that I'll share with you wrap up pretty much the content of the, of the whole of the Old Testament is wrapped up in these particular verses. The first one is from Matthew 22, it says, Jesus said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. You got that? First and greatest. The second is like it. You love your neighbor as yourself. And all of the law and of the prophets hang on these two commandments. Man, Jesus just puts it all in a nutshell, doesn't he? Everything that you've been told in the law, all you see in all the law, books of the law, and the five books of Moses, everything from the prophets, major, minor prophets, the Old Testament, all that, all that the, the Bible has to say of the Old Testament is written up in this and summarized in this. What's God want from my life? I guess I could ask the same question. It, answer, it answers here. Love, you, love God and love your neighbors yourself. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, strength. Love your neighbors yourself. Now, in line with that is the second little passage of Scripture that I talked about. We call that the Great Commission. The first one is the, the Great Commandment. The Great Commission is for the church. It's the first words of instruction that Jesus gives us as his people and as his followers, as his disciples. He says, you go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. There's a simple word from God, is it not? Now that you love God and you love people, go make disciples. And in those passages of scriptures, pretty much not only hang all the law, the pro law and the prophets, but hangs everything that God has for us as individuals and corporately as a people. We love God with all our heart. You know what that is? When you love God with all your heart, that's called worship. That's what real worship is. It's nice to come in and corporately worship, right? We worship, we sing the songs, we praise the Lord, but it goes far beyond that. Worship is me loving God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's, that's the epitome of all that worship is. And then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. You know what that is? That's ministry. That's what we've all been called to. Everybody, everybody that comes to Christ becomes a priest unto the Lord, it says in Scripture. And so we all are ministers of Christ. In fact, he calls us in 2 Corinthians ambassadors for Christ. Well, who we represent as an ambassador is the one who's given us this word. So for me to love my neighbor, and that's anybody around me, right, as myself, it means that God's given me a ministry. It means that God's given you a ministry. To go and make disciples, that's evangelism, all right? To teach them all things, that's discipleship. That's what we're about. That's what we do. It's an upward ministry. That upward ministry is worship, adoration, praise, prayer, thanksgiving to God. There's that inward ministry we've talked about in the past where within the body of Christ, we're, 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 we're making disciples and ministries and people are using their gifts and whether it's in lift or children or youth or in service ministry somewhere or deacon ministry or elder ministry, we're all doing those things together for the glory of God and we're using what God has given us in ministry. It's inward, but we build in, up the church, we encourage each other so we can fulfill the ministry. That takes us outward. So we have upward, inward, outward. That's that walk with God out in the lost world where we're sharing the message of life. That's where we live it. That's where we speak it. That's where we shine and be what God's called us to do. Out, out and of all that comes all the different things that we do. And we do a lot of things for God. It's exciting to be a part of this church and to see how many people do all they do for the, for the Lord in this fellowship. I would, I would take this church, we're not a large church, we're not a tiny church, but we are a church, you know, it's, a, it's, it's in that medium to small category. The average church in America runs about 65 people on a Sunday morning. That's even really, if you took and equated in the, the mega churches even, the average size church in America. So here we are in the church, it's above that, obviously two or three times above that, and we're doing so many different things for God, the average church has about... 10% of the people doing 80% of the work. I'd say we have about 70% of the people doing about 100% of the work. That's exciting to see that many people involved in ministry. 
Those of you sitting in this room, majority of you are doing something within the fellowship for the glory of God, within the body of Christ to honor God, to serve God, and to worship God in a very special, unique way. That is a blessing. We're a church that not only is, is doing things here in our Jerusalem, so to say, but we are reaching out in Judea, Samaria, the other most parts of the world. Matter of fact, I've got a couple of letters. I, I did share one of them on an e-blast, a portion of one this last week, from s- some pastors and churches. Well, not only have we begun this church about 30 years ago coming up this year is our anniversary, but in that time we've probably helped start about seven or eight other churches and been a sponsor, sister, and supportive church for those. And God's allowed us to do that. We help them usually from a period of two to five years as they get established and get started. One of the more recent ones that we did was with, uh, was uh, Pastor Patrick Stewart from Harvest Christian Fellowship. Now, Patrick spoke, I believe, at our marriage street last year and did a session. And the other is a church that we're not necessarily helping with a church plan. It's a church in Johannesburg, South Africa, that we're help doing ministries that they're doing that are just profoundly powerful ministries. And so we've ad- adopted them. Now, we support a lot of other ministries and missions and churches through the Southern Baptist Convention and mission giving and all those kind of things we support on local levels and state levels and international levels from seminaries to colleges to, 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 to new church plants to missionaries on the field. Rita Salter is another missionary supported by the convention. We also support along with their support that we send in. But just a couple of words. One, Patrick sent this word because he had said, please share with your church Thank you for all you guys have done. He said, words cannot express how much I personally appreciate the assistance that you guys have provided. I'm writing to say, big capital letters, thank you. Although it seems that thank you is just not sufficient enough for how God has used you in my life and Lisa's life and the Harvest Church. You'll never know how much of a blessing you have been and still are to us. Brother Joe, I've truly been blessing. You've been a blessing to me personally. You served as a pastoral mentor to me. It's been a priceless gift. Thank you so much. I've discovered in ministry there are those moments when it seems or feels that you are in the very bottom of the ditch, sometimes feeling alone as a pastor. Only to discover sometimes that's where God does his best work in the heart of his under shepherds. But I've discovered is this. The Lord will use wonderful people like you and the members of Believers Fellowship to accomplish his plans in our life. As pastor of Harvest Christian Fellowship Church, I am so grateful that God has given us beloved friends like you and Kathy. Both of you have been truly good friends and mentors to Lisa and I. We're truly blessed by your friendship and, and your love. And he goes on, Chloe, on behalf of Lisa and myself, the Harvest Christian Fellowship, we love you and we're so blessed because of all you've done for us. Your financial assistance, your prayer support, your partnering with us as we grow, the harvest has been such a wonderful blessing. We'll continually give thanks for you and pray the Lord's richest blessings on you and thank you again for everything that you have done. Hallelujah. Then I did get a word from Willie Dangler. Willie Dangler is the pastor of Mayfair Baptist Church in Johannesburg. Willie's been and spoken, I think, here on a, uh, I think he did a Wednesday night, did a men's dinner for us one night. Uh, And his ministry is is, is unique. And we felt a burden from early on as a church to be a part of that ministry because they're doing so much more than just within their church walls. They said that they, uh, he he just wrote me a, a quick thing. I want to express our most sincere gratitude for your yearly support for our growing and challenging work here in Johannesburg. We're aware of the difficult times you've gone through with Hurricane Harvey. And we want to uplift you to the Lord in your time of loss, but to say thank you as well said at Christmas we were able to give over 760 children gifts for Christmas. Our discipleship school, he goes on and talks about how they have all these, they have a discipleship school that reaches out into churches all around Johannesburg area and the small villages and how many, 110 churches that they help disciple their Christian members in. He said, we're, he said out of these ministries, we have now a Bible memory program and we print 10,000 calendars to students in 7th grade through 12th grade. Now, these calendars are memory verse calendars. He said they distribute these. He said, and these kids also receive a Bible and a certificate if they know their verses. We do this as part of a school curriculum in a day when the Bible is politically incorrect. You won't get many of those in public schools these days, will you? In the States, at least. He said this, this is the ministry that we're really interested in as well. He said we also di- disciple close to 10,000 prison inmates. Now, if you're not familiar with the prison system in South Africa, they're like, small cities, large cities in fact. There'll be 10,000 plus people in one prison. And uh, they go in and they establish churches in these prisons. And they assign pastors. They win men to the Lord and disciple men and put them through seminary in prison. And those who go out of prison can go out and rehabilitate and loving Jesus and have a ministry in their life. And many of them go out and start churches in these villages. 
He said, we go in, he said, he would take the guys who are there for, for, that are lifers in prison, those that we win, and those who feel called to ministry, we put them through our seminary, and they become the pastors within those prisons over those churches. So they have whole churches that meet in these prisons, all right? He said, we have about 10,000 inmates that we, we have been discipling. We expanded the need for next year will be 15,000 Bibles for uh, our, our prison ministry in 2018. He said, we feed about 400 children twice a week at Zampillo, which is a squatter camp. Pray that we get enough feeding for the needy. The mercy ministry is an extension of compassion and love of Christians like you guys in the States. Anyway, he goes on and talks about the different ministries that we're doing. But I wanted to share those so you see a little bit that we are doing things even beyond our borders that perhaps most folks never get to see. This week, and the instruction of our elders, I was in Belize, Central America, where we were distributing checks to pastors and to churches that were helping. There's about nine or ten ministries down there. I think there's 11 in total, what we've done over the last few months, that we're helping them specifically. You know, those of you who are members or regular tenders, that every year in Belize, Central America, our church uniquely host a conference for pastors and their wives that are Baptists. Now, my goal ultimately is by 2020, we go outside just the Baptist realm, we start bringing in pastors of all denominations. But right now, we're just working with the Baptist churches in Belize, Central America. The pastors come, their wives come, there's no cost to them. In fact, we give them, I think, about $40 uh, to help them with their travel expenses. It is a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Most of the pastors are bivocational. So basically, $40 either helps some of their expense, or that's about a day's wages in Belize. How'd you like to be working for that. Amen. And so we're paying at least the days that they're going to have to take off, one day at least. And so they come to a central location, we bring them in, we provide food for them, we put them in a nice place to stay, and we have conferences. And part of the conference is to deal with their family, part of the conference is for training, and a part of the conference is set for just for revival preaching so they can experience revival in their life. Because we all need a little revival at least once a year. Amen. And so we're, we do these conferences, but out of this conference this year, Knowing that uh, the elders, as we discussed and were praying, we had seen kind of a blessing that would happen as a result from the fact that we're moving one of our campuses in Magnolia because of eminent domain. The state of Texas bought out that property, and now we have to move, and we're in construction. I'll mention that in a moment of what's going on there. But there was, a, there was extra money that we had not really thought that we would get that came in. And whether we'd gotten extra money or not, we already know that you get by giving. And there's a principle of sowing seeds in Scripture. And so we knew that we had this money coming in, even dedicated whatever. We needed to give a portion of that. And so the goal was to give a portion of that to churches in Belize and some other locations. But we went down there and to, at the conference last year, knowing that we'd be coming back to give them specific funds. I asked them on their form for registration, because when they get to the, to the, to the, to the hotel, they sign up and register. And on the, there were two questions we put on this year. We asked them, one of them, what is your greatest spiritual need in your church right now? And two is, what is your greatest physical need in your church right now? And they responded, every one of them responded to what the greatest spiritual need. Well, we need a revival. We need, we need this and that. We need discipleship. Or we need, you know, and they just listed whatever they thought the spiritual need was for their fellowship as pastors. And we agreed we'd be praying with them for those things. But the other thing, uh, only about 10 pastors put something down for the physical need. Now, when I met with these pastors to be a blessing to them and give them funds for those needs that they had mentioned... I let them know that they needed to get a pat on the back for having the courage to put their hand out when somebody asked. And there's something about our pride that kind of keeps us from doing that. And there sometimes we, you have any needs? No, I'm all right. And you know, we're just dying inside, right? And I said, so, you know, one is we have been blessed. Our blessings come out of our calamities. They usually do anyway, don't they? Our biggest blessings. He said, we had a trial. We had an issue. So we'd like to be a blessing to you. And here's what we're going to do. So these 10 pastors, I followed up over, over the last six months and I asked them to be specific. I had them send in uh, more specific you know, listing of what their needs were, the cost of what they were. Some sent in things, well, we need $20,000 because we're going to be building this part of adding on to our church and school that we do. The, many of the churches there have, have Christian schools that they operate. It's one of the big ways of evangelism for these churches many times in Belize. And so we need this. One was simple as just we need a church office. We, we, have, this, we have this large building with no rooms in it and, 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 and no office in it. We have to have a place where we can take people to counsel or pray with or just for the pastor to study him would be nice. Some were as simple as we built our building and we have toilets. Uh, we have places to set toilets, but we ran out of money. And when they say build a building, it's not like building a building here. It's like they put up four walls, all right, and they have some big 
flap down windows they put over and they open them up for church and turn on the ceiling fans, all right? He said, uh, we put in restroom area, but we don't have the money for toilets. Or we, we built the building, but we don't have any money for fans. Or we have an old building that uh, has been here for 100 years and now termites have gotten to it and the whole back structure is falling down. Or it's rotted out. Or, so there were all these things and we had them provide, you know, bids from the people they were talking to and cost factors and all that. Went over all these things and committed uh, overall to all around $45,000. So we were down there this week. We'd already taken some of it down before. We went down this week to hand out to nine different pastors that sat in meetings. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to show you just a little brief clip. Please forgive the video and the audio. We're in a loud room. I was meeting with dinner for these pastors as they came. And so in the background, you hear all this noise. Uh, we just set up a, 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 an iPhone and, you know, had them just look in the iPhone and, and just say a word to you of, of gratitude. So we're, we're in a very dim lit rooms, got fluorescent lights. You're in a third world country. Just remember that, all right? And then we have third world equipment kind of <laughs> just taken for video, basically. But we shot this video of just a minute or two for some pastors, and I, I wanted to, to let them say thank you to you for what you have done for them and their churches. And this is not all of them. It's just about six or so of them. Thank uh, Pastor Joe and his church so much for this great help you know, that he is giving our church. You know, for a long time now, we have been in need of a church office. And with this help, we will begin construction as, as soon as possible. I want to thank you so much, Pastor Joe, and God bless you. I want to say hi to the believers, the Fellowship Church. I'm Pastor Wien Lopez from Pomona of this church in the southern district of Belize. I want to say a great thank you to all of you for the contribution you had uh, sent for us. And uh, this contribution will be using it to complete our bathroom facility at church and to make it secure and uh, to finish some tile work on it and some other finishing work, you know, up in preparing the um, structure, you know, to host people and, and do the work of ministry. But I want to say many, many thanks and, and God bless you and we'll be praying for you guys. Hello, uh, I am Pastor Frederick Collard from Queen Street Baptist Church and uh, we are one of the recipients of the funds that was given to us from Pastor Joe Arms from your church. We are very grateful, we are very elated um, the funds came on a timely manner. Our church is in a good, in, good in structure and uh, because our gutters got broken, the water was being poured on the side of the building so the wood has been rotting and uh, we're going to use it to replace all those woods on one of the sides of the building and some of our windows were having a leak as well and so we'll be upgrading those windows so that we can have windows that are more waterproof for the weather and uh, more burglar proof um, but once again we are very grateful and uh, thankful for you guys' support and we look forward um, to hearing back from you and you will hear of how the improvements are going. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is uh, Mark Somerville. I'm the pastor of Cattleville Baptist Church. You know, and we're very grateful because we had received uh, a numerous of help from true uh, Pastor Joel and his church. And we want to tell you guys that we are so blessed and happy to be a part of that ministry here in Belize. Uh, I have received uh, a, some money from the church to be able to reach out to the people in Hattieville in terms of feeding program. We have a lot of struggling mothers uh, um, that is single parent and sometimes the kids they will go to school and uh, um, not well fed and so this is a big blessing for our uh, community here in Belize that I pastor and so I want to tell the church back in Texas and Pastor Joe and everybody thank you so much and God continue to bless your ministry. Thank you. Hey members of BF, BF Church, uh, this is Pastor Rob. Uh, I am presently 
acting in the position of president of the Bank Association of Belize. And I want to express my deepest gratitude to your, your people, your church, for uh, reaching out so graciously to our churches in Belize, uh, understanding that you have went through some really disastrous experience recently. Yet, through it all, you, you've maintained uh, posture by even you know, reaching out to us here in Belize and assisting us. We cannot, words cannot ex really explain and express how deeply we are indebted to you for this kind of support. Um, my, my responsibility is the facility of the Baptist Association and this is the building we're in, this is one of the facility that was the brainchild of the original missionary uh, Otis Brady, uh, Southern Baptist missionary, uh, came and this was, it was his dream that we would have a place to come as a church, as a body, to meet and greet and talk about the business of the association. And so my responsibility, this is part of my responsibility and I'm so glad that your church have decided to assist us in retaining the top of our church has been suffering tremendously from the weather's experience. And I, we want you to know that we are extremely grateful for your assistance and that we, 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 we hope to, we hope to uh, be able to change off the, the, the top of the roof, the tins and, and so on. And been having some tremendous problems. So thank you again. Thank you again for reaching out to us in this way. We do thoroughly appreciate your support. God bless you all and be blessed. My name is Henry Weiser. I'm a pastor of San Hill Baptist Church and also the Executive Secretary Treasurer of the Baptist Association of Belize. On behalf of the association, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for your assistance to our churches and um, know that we will make very good use of what, we, what, what you have given to us and we are grateful. Um, the, the portion for the association will be used to assist our different ministries in the association to allow them to be more active in doing their ministry. Uh, we have several ministries in the church. We have men, women, youth, and especially the youth. We, 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 we place emphasis on the youth simply because the, our youths are the future, and we try to build them up. They have camps every year. They have sports events every year and different events. So this, this money will assist greatly in assisting them a bit more so that they can do a bit more, thus build up the kingdom of God. Once again, thanks very much. And may God bless each and every one of you. In the midst of all these things, recovering ourselves from storms and building another building at the same time across town, uh, it's just, it's been a very unique season for us as a church. I think one of the things that astounded these guys in Belize City is that uh, that we came through with the funds for them at this particular time when we were having so many needs ourselves uh, in our own fellowship. But I tried to let them know when we say something to someone, we make a commitment to someone, it's going to get done. That uh, Believer's Fellowship as a church, it means what it says and says what it means. Amen? And we'll do what we said. This has been a tremendous journey just with those guys before I talk about some of that and seeing what God has allowed them to do. Some of that money was used uh, for feeding single moms and their families. Some was used for the association for the youth camp. Some was used for building facilities in regard to restoring property. Some, two or three you didn't see had to do with the toilets being placed or fans being placed or electrical being done. One church in Belmapan, the Baptist church there, some of you have been in that church with me. Uh, the whole educational wing, the back of it had been infested by termites and was just literally unstable anymore. So this goes in to take out those structural beams and restore all that back there. Uh, now, that was $10,000 that we'd given them, but that's, that's $20,000 in Belize, and that goes a long way in Belize, $20,000 does. In fact, while we were talking, Joseph and I were on the phone talking about something in regard to our equipment with the guy who installed all our video systems and these things before we bought, purchased from, 
and he made reference to Joseph that he was on his way to Belmapan to take on a work project at the Baptist church there to help him restore the building. We let him know that he can go because we gave the money. <laughs> so they were, I thought it was just great the way the Lord works. So you can, the Lord, we, we provided funds and their church was providing labor. So that was a great thing. So it's just amazing how the, and when the church is just being the church in the world, what God does. And it's always important for us to do our part. God will take care of the rest of it if we just do our part. And so many people, they just don't understand that. And in the smaller things of life, you do what you're supposed to, God will take care of the rest. Do what you're supposed to do in the church, God will take care of the rest. Do what you're supposed to do in your marriage, God's going to take care of it. Amen? Do what you're supposed to do in your job, God will take care of the rest. Do what you're supposed to do. And there's a great lesson that comes out of that. You add to the fact that while this was going on, through this process of being bought out and moved to another location. We are going along with the construction and sometime April hopefully will be finalized and getting into that building. We put around a seven or eight thousand square foot pavilion up first in case we don't aren't finished with the interiors in time and we have to get out of the place that we're in, we'll have a place to move to. But that pavilion will also serve a lot of opportunities for ministry in the future. And it wouldn't be a bad idea to put one similar out here for these kind of events as well. But uh, we've been able to do a lot of things there. We're on target to get the, the building up. We've been able to do a lot of reconstruction here. There were close to $400,000, $500,000 in losses counting contents and building and reconstruction that were part of the insurance claim that went on here. So we, as a result of that, uh, I, you know, I don't understand these floods when they come, but they always seem to come at the time we need to repaint anyway, <laughs> or re-carpet anyway. So maybe it's God's way of letting us get some benefit from all the insurance money we've been paying. Amen. But it came at a time we were able to redesign the stage, put in new lighting in the whole worship center, the parking lot. We put up storage buildings outside. There's more to come. We'll be recarpeting the upstairs as well now with those funds we've received that are a part of that. So again, out of our curses come blessings when you're the children of God. So there's, there's a lot that goes on. Now here's the amazing part about everything that we're doing as a church. All right, whether it's these conferences, whether it's printing Bibles for Bulgarians, whether it's supporting missionaries or sponsoring churches or helping the churches in Central America, we're a church that, now Ket, hold your breath just for a moment, we're debt free. Amen. Can I say that again? We're debt free. <laughs> Makes you want to get on Dave Ramsey's program and say, we're debt free! <laughs> <You know? laughs> Hallelujah. Now, if you're not debt free, you don't know what a blessing that is. All right? There's such freedom. There's so many things you can do. There's so many opportunities you can, you can seize. There's so many things you can do for the kingdom of God. So we rejoice that in the midst of all this, you've been faithful to serve the Lord and honor the Lord in time and over time with your gifts and with your faithfulness and your service to the Lord to, to, for us to be in that kind of position. And then for us to be able to do more and more what God's called us to do. And it was interesting that as a result of the, of the flood, that what happened as a result of the flood is that we realized we couldn't meet down here probably for a month and two or three months, right? So where are we going to meet? Well, we said we have the upstairs youth room seats about 150 if we squeeze everybody in real tight. But we know that you couldn't get this crowd up there today. You'd just barely squeeze us in if you could. So we said, we're going to need some overflow space that will meet up in a clean area. And we'll have an overflow room for people that can come in that can't get upstairs, either one, or don't want to ride that lift up there because it takes two and, two and a half days to get up on that lift to, to upstairs. You know, you can clean your toenails while you're on way if you got that much time. All right. So we want an area. So with that, uh, we, the church had hired uh, my son Joseph on through the end of January to help us with all the, the interior reconstruction things that were going on and, you know, resupplying and refitting everything that needed to be refitted. And so uh, he said, well, I got an idea. Let's just use uh, Facebook live stream. So out of that technology, just live streaming to another section of the building, we discovered that, hey, there's, there's up to 200 plus people logging on every Sunday to watch our worship service. Now, not all of them are real time, but a bunch of them are. But I mean, there's still 245 has been the average per week. And that's just setting up a little mini iPad or an iPhone and shooting it. All right. So out of this, you know, it all gets back to technology and what we're doing with technology. And I just want to share a little bit about what's, what's coming in the days ahead. Right. It's back in 2009, we realized that we needed how, how crazy the internet was going and how many people are starting to log on to the internet and use the internet for everything from finding a marriage partner to buying groceries to shopping on Amazon. Some of you wouldn't have got through Christmas without Amazon, would you? So we better take it. We saw back then where this thing would come up, where it was heading. So we said, well, let's get this put together. And we developed an internet site and Joseph was even part of that. And we started working on all that. And so 
as we developed the, the website and having a web presence there, we began to use it to be in more interactive with the world around us, not just to give information. Majority of people who visit a church will first and foremost go to the website in the day that we're living in. They're going to go see what the ministries are. What the, what the, they're going to listen to the preacher a little bit. They're going, to, they're going to use it. So it becomes a tool for opening our church door before people even get to the open door. So it's become an important tool, and we're seeking always to enhance that. But to tie that in with the Facebook medium and use the live stream medium outreach, now I begin to realize how much more we can do in the days that are ahead of us. There's some things we'd like to do uniquely with that. One thing that has to happen, we've been discussing with the elders, or some things that have to, we need to upgrade our technology here in the worship center. This needs to go from just standard definition, which is old school, up to a high definition that we can broadcast with. Already on, on, on our Facebook, on our, on our website, you can access this through Facebook. And you folks that are watching through Facebook, everybody here welcomes you to the service today. But we want, we want to present to you a lot better, clearer product. If you've taken the time to go back to our Facebook and watch it, you realize it's not coming over the, the Crammer system we're using here. It's just a little independent device that we're using to broadcast with. And it's not the greatest clarity, and it's not the greatest zoom. We've done what we can do to make it a little better and a little more presentable. But once we're able to tie it into the equipment we have, it'll be a whole different thing. It'll be like watching a TV program. It'll be that clean, that crisp, and that clear. So everything's going to a, a, a high-def package so we can do that. Out of YouTube, we began to first realize this. I mean, out of our, out of our website, because then we started started putting our sermons out on YouTube and established a YouTube channel. Crystal did a great job in getting all those things started to tie in and start putting that up. We were already putting videos on our website, but when we started a YouTube channel, we have to about 100 subscribers who watch those programs regularly when they're posted each week, when they go out. And we have people in different countries that are watching our channel. I get letters from people overseas at different times say, hey, is your sermon been posted? I'm not getting it for this week. You know, so you know, we're ministering to people in all different kinds of places and all different locations through this medium. Now, when we're able to take that production with YouTube and bring a lot better quality to our Facebook and other venues, and the goal is ultimately just to begin. Right now, we have, an, we have a spring campus and we have a Magnolia campus, but the goal will be to develop a third campus, and that will be an online campus. An online campus where people who can't come are people who are hindered because of job or situations or workloads or family needs or whatever it might be, they can't come. There's a lot of people I've talked to, even this last week, who said, I, I can't be there on Sunday due to the nature of my job. He said, but I can't take time where I sit back and I listen and I participate on, the, on the, either the YouTube channel. He said, most of the time, I am turning on the live feed when it comes on while I'm working. And the kind of work it does, he can do that and still do his job while he's listening. And so it's, it's an interesting medium that God's given us. And so we thought about what can we do to get, it started kind of like that. We have these venues out there, but how do we connect with people? How do we, how do we, how do we really reach people? If our goal is to, to disciple, to make disciples, how can we make disciples there? Because there's so many people that are there for whatever reason, they can't come. We're reaching an unlimited amount of people who are homebound. Some are shift workers, some are disabled, some are elderly, can't get to church anymore. And many of them are just unchurched people who have somebody tagged them and wanted them to watch a broadcast, and they, they came and watched. The goal will be to take this whole mindset of our feed and our YouTube and develop this online campus where people can participate, where they can talk to somebody, where they can online chat with somebody, where they can reach out to a pastor, and a pastor will reach out to them. And you say, I just don't know if that'll work. You know, I don't know about this whole relationships in the Internet. I want to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you met your wife or your husband on the Internet? I say, there'll be more raised hand if I ask you to raise your hand, all right? That's just, it's just, it's, it's the way people relate anymore in social mediums, through social media, of just touching people. And if we miss an opportunity here and wait 10 years down the road, I think we're going to miss an opportunity to reach a lot of people. Ultimate goal will bring them in. I had Joseph, who's working on this side by side with me, prepare a, a dossier, so to say, and he gave me about a three-page report here on the pros and cons, and done a lot of research on establishing an online medium for the church to relate to people, what to avoid and how to, how to pull it off, and what you can do, and what the cons are, as well as the pros, and how do you avoid the cons and the things that are negative and really bring people in. When people say, well, if you do that, people won't come to church. Tell them, no, you guys are coming to church. You could stay home and watch anybody on TV today. There are going to be people like that anyway. 
But for the most part, that's not the scenario, and that's not the crowd that we're reaching. But there is this avenue where we have a ministry where people now can begin, they can be part of people who are prayer warriors. They can be contributors. They can be supporters of the ministry. They can reach out to other people who could make it or who are, are, are in the same situation. They're in a situation where they can't get They can reach out to them and involve them in ministry. And people will be saved, and people's lives will be changed, and we'll disciple people in those kind of scenarios, in those kind of formats. It's a tremendous opportunity. And I think we're going to, to, to zero in on this opportunity we, as we upgrade the equipment and pr produce all these things in a much cleaner and, and a better fashion with our audio and our video. It's going to make all the difference in the world. Add to that, that's just a little bit of some of the things that we're looking at in 2018. With the ministries that God's called us to do, whether it's our wanted ministry, any areas of children's ministry, our youth ministries, our singles, our married, whatever it is, we're going to seek to be and to do all that God wants us to do and to be all that God wants us to be in each and every area. We need to just have this mindset for this year and talk about new beginnings that we're going to excel in what God has called us to do. I believe as, we, as we're making preparations for this year, whether it's been our retreats, our men's retreats, the women's retreats, these things that are on schedule, we're approaching the whole fresh set of eyes. What can we do uniquely? What can it be? How can it be better? How can we see God's presence? How can there be more anointing on it? How can we reach men? How can we reach people in these venues, in these formats of ministry that God has called us to reach them? How can we do it? And how can we do it? We just don't want to be repetitive and mundane and boring and old. You know, and if we get that way, then who wants to be a part of anything? So I think that as we as a people, as we seek God's faith, there's nothing more creative than God, all right? No one. And so we need to be creative in our ministries, whatever they are. Just, you know, sometimes it's best to put down, you know, just the way we've been doing it and say, how do you want us to do it, God? Whether it's my lift group, a Bible study, grief share, whatever it is. How can we do this for the glory of God the best that we can do it for the glory of God? That should be our heart and that should be our passion. When we install these equipments, it will allow us in the future days to prepare for two services. Now, we'll start with a, an experimental version of it on Easter. We won't continue it immediately after Easter. will come in later in the year. But the goal is on Easter to have a live streaming service here in the worship center. That we'll have a morning, an early sunrise service in Magnolia is the goal right now in the new pavilion. Then there'll be a 9 o'clock service at Magnolia where I'll stick in there. I'm not going to do every Sunday morning. I'll preach that 9 o'clock service. But the goal on Easter Sunday morning is to have two services here. We'll have a 9 o'clock service, which will be an early service, and a 1045 hour regular service. The worship teams will be in place. All the things will be going just like they do every Sunday, every service where you're sitting here participating and singing along in worship. It'll all be live right here until the preaching. And then at 9 o'clock, when the preaching time comes around 930, then that service from Magnolia will be live streamed to this campus with equipment that will be used to upgrade with. And so you'll have that. So people who want to come to a 9 o'clock service, you know, and don't mind sitting there and watching me on the screen. I'll be interacting with them even on the screen because I'll be, it'll be a live service. And I'll be interacting with both campuses within that worship service. Then they can participate. 1045, I'll be here for the 1045. So if you just have to see me in person, join me at 1045. All right? But it's, these are things that we've got to, to embrace and to realize that there's just more opportunities to reach people than we could probably even imagine. We just need to open a heart and our mind to what God would have us to do. Amen? I, I'm excited about the events that are coming. I, I'd, I'd mentioned the men's retreat this morning at the other campus that's, that's coming up. They're going to do some different things at the men's retreat this year. It's going to be at Palacios, by the way. I know you guys that love saltwater fishing are going to love that. And there'll be the golf tournament and the fishing tournament, but there are going to be some things within the retreat itself that we're going to do. They're going to make it unique. And you do not want to miss it this year. All right? And by the way, I don't even know why you'd want to if you're a member of this church. It's what we do. We do this together. It's our church. All right? So come. Be a part of it. It's the same thing with men and women's ministry. If you can, and there's no reason for you not to be, then why don't you just come and be a part of it? Some of you probably have never been, and you don't know what you're missing until you get there and participate in one of these things and see what God will do in your life. But even not so much even for yourself. Have we out yet discovered that this is not about me even? It's about others. What can I do to impact? What man can I reach to have there at that conference? What, man, what person can I, can, I, can I actually touch for the glory of God and make a difference in their life by inviting them to the church or bringing them to a conference or bringing them to a rally or bringing them to, to an event or break, taking them to a lift group? We've got to live it loud, folks. And this, that's the, the heartbeat that we have to embrace because with all this decline, you know what's happening in the church in America today? One, because people aren't standing on the truth. 
and they're not living the truth, and they're not preaching the truth. So many churches have de deferred not to preach the Word of God, and it doesn't make any sense because this is the church. This is the platform for preaching the Word of God, and it is the Word of God that changes people's lives. Amen. You never got changed. You know, the Lions Club's not going to change you. The Kiwanis, all right, Eastern Star, none of that's going to change you. Jesus is what changes your life. Jesus is who changes your life. It's just time, to, hey, it's time to do it or get out of the race. Amen? I, I, don't know why, I don't know what it is that attracts some people who just want to come to church and just do a little church on Sunday and, and not live for Jesus Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It's, it's, not, it's about following Jesus. So let's commit to follow Jesus, you know, and use every venue of ministry that God's called us to. And we've talked a lot about it over the last several Sundays, uh, the fact that we're here for the glory of God, to love God, and to, to love people. I shared with you last week these eight points. One, I said we have to depend upon the Holy Spirit. Number two, I said we had to love people. Number three, I said we have to embrace the biblical model of ministry groups, that we serve God in a large corporate fellowship, and then we're involved in ministries on a smaller level where we can touch people more completely with the Word of God and minister to them and counsel them and pray for each other in that kind of venue. The fourth thing I said last week was we have to realize God's bigger than what we are. And God's vision for our church is big. And God's desire for us is big. It's not about the numerics. It's about ministry. And out of that pours people. All right? And it says as we do what God's called us to do, the Lord will add to the church as He desires. That's not my department. That's His department. My department is trusting Him believing Him, reaching out to Him. And if I do, guess what? I will believe in the power of prayer. We, you can't make it, folks, this year. You think you had a rough time last year? Forget about it this year. You ain't going to make it if you learn how to pray. If you don't learn how to pray, you don't have much hope. And the more that we go into these last days and ages that the Lord gives this world, this time to repent, I call it. The Bible says, you know, as God's been patient, waiting for us to repent. This time of this, this window of repentance that we have, hey, it's going to get more difficult, though. You have got to learn how to pray. Yes. And you've got to learn how to see God's face. <laughs> Not just individually. Corporately, we pray together. And we pray in all different kinds of venues and all different kinds of formats. We pray, we, hey, we, we pray on the Internet through emails. <laughs> we send those out. We pray in lift group. We pray in worship service. We pray, and we believe God is big, and we pray. But number six, I said, and this is where I'm so proud of you guys, because you have proven to be a generous people. But never stop being generous. Never stop being faithful in this, regard, in this regard. In fact, you should be figuring out how you can give more, not less. Amen? Amen? That ought to be the desire of every Christian. When we really realize who God is and how God's going to move in people's lives and what God can do in a person's life, hey, I think it generates that in us. We, we watched the movie the other night here in the church. We had the case for Christ. And at the, towards the end of the movie, when Lee Strobel, in the movie's kind of biographical film of him, when he's praying to receive Jesus Christ, it was so touching but it reminded me, one, of when I prayed to receive Jesus Christ, but it also reminded me how many people have prayed to receive Christ through our ministries. Amen. How many lives have been changed through Believer's Fellowship Church? How many of our lives have been affected yes. through, through this fellowship that we have? Amen. Through whether it's been a prayer of salvation or a prayer of repentance and revival, that God did a work that was so powerful. That ought to cause us all to let go of the wallet for a little bit, amen, and be generous in what God's called us to do. The power of changed lives. You can't get around that. The seventh and eighth things are just as simple. One, discover our ministries. Eighth was be intentional with it. In other words, when I get up on Monday, I realize I'm on mission for God. Yes. So I'm going to be on mission for God today. Will, will you be on mission for God tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday? And we say, what's that mean, Pastor? That means when I get up in the morning and my feet roll out from those covers when they know they don't want to. <laughs> And I put my feet on the ground. I declare this is the day the Lord hath made. God's got a plan for my life today. God's got something he's going to do with me today. Yes. And I may not see half of it, but he's going to do it anyway if I just live for him. Amen. I'll just live for him today. And I'll be intentional. I will invite people to the kingdom. I'll invite people to church. I'll invite people to Bible study. I'll invite people to Wednesday night. I'll invite people wherever I go. Ultimately to Jesus. Amen. I'll be sensitive. I'll put my little spiritual antennas out, and so I'll be trying to be sensitive to whatever signals may be coming across from God. He may have me in a line at the auto parts store. It may be at Walmart, God forbid. <laughs> I love Walmart. All right, if you're working at Walmart, I apologize, but hey, it's not my favorite place. 
That and grocery stores, so don't take offense, all right? But there may be somebody there who's just hurting, whose life is devastated, whose home is falling apart, whose kids are creating crisis in their lives. You could be the very instrument that God uses to speak to them, say something to them, and change their life for eternity. If not, just encourage them in that moment. That's being intentional. Yes. We're wasting our lives if we're not. We're wasting God's time if we're not. We're salt to be salty. We're light to be bright. Let's shine, and let's be used of God. I, I shared this morning in our Magnolia campus something I, I probably need to say here. People say, well, Brother Joe, what do, you, what do you want from me today? Just to listen to what I'm saying. Just to hear me. And, you know, I'm not really stupid. I'm not smartest guy, but I'm not stupid. I can tell when I'm preaching to any audience who's shutting me out and who's opening up the door. You, you can see the lights go up. <laughs> Until a certain part of the sermon is over, the, the lights will come back on. It's kind of like, you know, that internal mute button on the pastor. If I don't like what he's saying, I'll just smile and pretend I'm listening. <laughs> Listen, I, I honestly seek God's face regularly. And when I'm studying and preparing a message for you, and it's for me. And I honestly seek to embrace every aspect of everything. I'm not asking anybody in this church to do what I don't ask of myself to do. Seriously, I'm just saying that. I mean that with all my heart. And so if there's an issue that you're having, you know, don't tune out the preacher. Ask God if that's for you. Amen. Listen, what, what can you do? What can you be? What can you accomplish? If you'll just say, hey, I'm on board. I want this whole gospel thing, count me in. This whole Jesus deal, I'm following but somewhere in the process of this whole decline of the church in American culture is because people quit following. Oh, they attend. They're not followers. So get on board. What do you say, Pastor? I say we all have to be a part if we're going to be what God's called us to be. Do you not realize what God's doing in your own life? And I know many of your lives very, very closely. And I've seen what God's done with you, and I've seen how God has weaved this unique life that he's given you into a very, very clear picture of grace. Your experience is good, your problems bad, the issues, the failures, the successes. It's all been kind of woven together like a, like a tapestry that all speaks when, when, when you're walking in the Spirit. It all speaks to the grace of God. You're a walking testimony of the power of God. You are. Somebody ought to praise the Lord. Don't, don't you see it? We fail to see it if we're not just surrendering daily. You know, I'll, I'll let you know that. But when I am, I begin to see, wow, God's done something in me. And I've got a story. It's a gospel story. I've got a story that's rich and full. It's unique and it's awesome. And I, I, need to, I need to be living it out loud. I need to be letting the world see it. But catch this. It's not just what God's done in you. It's what God done corporately, all together, all apart what God's done uniquely. Catch this. So I'm not just this little tapestry that's out here, which is just, it's an, it's an interesting story of God's grace, and it's going to reach a lot of people, as yours is, but it's woven into a larger mosaic of all of our lives together of God's grace. And we present a, an awesome, incredible picture of the grace and the power of God when we're all blended together. I love you guys, and I know you love each other. And I, I think it's just time every once in a while to just step back and say, wow, God is moving. God is working. Now, you can sit back and pull out your pencil and critique every little thing in the church, but that just makes you a critic. I, that's my responsibility as an elder, as a pastor. I, I, I don't like it. I have to sit down and write down where, where, where we're missing God at. All right? And there's nothing wrong with seeing those things, but it's just seeing them and just talking about them. Somebody else and this guy and this guy, this guy, well, I think if we do this better, I think about doing this better. Well, get on board. Start doing something. <laughs> There's lots of room for that, amen? Yeah. If we all just get busy serving God, it'll change. Yeah. And I've usually found that God is bugging me about an area in the church. It's usually when I need to be a part of more. Amen? Yeah. So if God's bugging you a specific area, just say, okay, God, I'm, I'm troubled about this thing, so what do you want me to do? Yeah. And then come to one of the elders. Come on to the pastor. Hey, I, I, I've got a burden for this area. What can I do? Come to the leader of that ministry. Say, what can I do? 
But ultimately, we see the power and the glory of God being demonstrated, and God does a great work. Let's, let's, you say, what do you want, Pastor? I just want you to listen. Listen carefully and see what God will do with our church and with our lives this coming year. And we just choose to say, I'm in. Count on me. Count me in. I'm part of this. I'm going to be intentional in my life. I'm asking each and every one of you to join with the leadership of this fellowship. Trust the leadership of this fellowship. Believe in what God's mission is for our church. Get on board. Can I get an amen? Amen. That's all I have to say. (laughs) Now, I would let you be dismissed, but I know we have a few announcements. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Let's do this before I call up Brother Tim. We have a couple announcements we're going to make in a second. But I'd ask you just to bow your head with me. We're not giving an invitation, but just right there where you're seated. And if you are in, tell the Lord. Just tell the Lord, I'm in. And maybe there's something the Lord's trying to speak to you about today. You just need to be honest with him. Say, Lord, this has been a hindrance. I put that before you. Walk me through this. Get me through this. I choose you over me. Father, we love you, and thank you for this blessing you've given. It's called Believer's Fellowship. Thank you that we can do all the things you've let us do to be a blessing to so many other people in different parts of the world. It's all about you and how big you are. Help us to even see that more. We want to, we want to be what you've called us to be. We don't, not a one of us want to stand before you one day and see failure. We want to hear from you and from your mouth the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That's our passion. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Before they come, two things. One, if you're a guest today, I'll be out in the lobby. I'd love to meet you. Just take a moment. Two, don't forget your tithes and offerings. We don't take a passive plate. We do have offering receptacles at the exit door. Just place those in as you come and go.